Taylor Swift's arguably best song is not one of her biggest hits. It's not one of those songs that's just sucked up tens of thousands of hours of radio play. It's probably not one of those songs that adoring fans would bring up if you asked them while they're in line at one of her concerts. But it's a song so deep and powerful and haunting that Taylor herself decided, I need to release this song over and over and over and over and over again. Let's talk about it. What's up guys, my name is Connor and today we're going to be talking about, you guessed it, Willow by Taylor Swift. I'll admit I have some personal bias here, it's my favorite Taylor Swift song. But I think I can make a case for its greatness and that's what we're going to try to do today. So if you've been living under a freaking rock and you don't know who Taylor Swift is, and if that's you, why are you watching this video? Why are you here? Taylor's an American singer-songwriter from the Reading area of Pennsylvania. She got her first big break in the country scene at the age of 16. She was able then to successfully springboard that into a long and illustrious pop career that has made her maybe the most iconic musician on on the planet today. The song we're going to be talking about, Willow, was part of the Evermore album that she released as a surprise in December of 2020. The song was written and produced by Taylor and Aaron Dessner, who's one of two producers that she's worked with consistently over the last few years, along with Jack Antonoff. So what makes this song in particular so great? Well, it's a love song, but Taylor Swift writes a lot of love songs. The love song trope has been done to death. There are more love songs out there than atoms in the universe. So coming up with and executing on an original love song idea is incredibly hard to do. But lyrically, this song kind of occupies its own space, and I haven't heard anything that really lives in the exact same lane. The basic premise is very simple. Taylor writes this song from the perspective of a protagonist who's sad, lonely, kind of heartbroken, and then this mystery man rolls in and gives her life new meaning. She sees this man as kind of priceless, which is bolstered by a lot of the imagery in the song comparing him to priceless objects. She includes lines like, lost in your current like a priceless wine, as if you were a mythical thing, like you were a trophy or a champion ring, and even the line every bait and switch was a work of art compares his actions to a priceless item. So Mystery Man just rolls on in and all of a sudden she's just captivated, she's willing to follow this guy anyway. And that's the premise of the song. It's fun, it's a little different, but it's nothing too game changing. The real brilliance of the lyrics is how she specifically conveys this story. To begin with, her use of metaphor, man. It's so good. Right from the beginning, you've got I'm like the water when your ship rolled in that night. Instantly, you're put in the scene. A ship in the dark, coming in the shore, cutting through the water. And the brilliance of that entire first verse is it continues the metaphor, but it also subtly makes it seem as if it's about a shipwreck without ever explicitly saying that. The ship could just be rolling in and docking, but for me, it's the last line in that verse. Lost in your current like a priceless wine. The only reason that I can think of that a priceless wine would be in the current is if the ship wrecked and the wine either went overboard or escaped into the ocean when the ship started to flood. So subtle, so tasteful, and ah, just beautiful. In fact, that's a theme all throughout is the subtlety of her metaphors. Like the first line of the second verse, life was a willow when it bent right to your way. What does that mean? There's a bunch of ways you could read that. A willow is often a symbol of sadness because of the way it droops and the branches just kind of flow down towards the ground. It's also a tree that's often tied to mystery in the occult, which along with the instrumentation, which we'll talk about later, creates this very mysterious air to this song. And that feeling lines up perfectly with this mystery man image that she's trying to portray. So you've got the metaphors, you've got this tinge of sadness, this air of mystery, and all of that's supplemented by this unbalanced cadence that she uses. There are sections where she'll have a very short line stating something, and then a longer line elaborating on that thing. An example is one of the lines I mentioned earlier, as if you were a mythical thing, like you were a trophy or a champion ring. She also does the same thing in the first verse. And if it was an open shut case, I never would have known from the look on your face. She creates a question and a little bit of suspense, and then immediately elaborates with a longer explanation that finishes with a rhyming word and fills out the rest of the space in that part of the stanza. Another thing that really struck me about the lyrics in this song is that the verses and the chorus seem to have completely unique lyrical identities. As we've already discussed, the verses are very kind of dark, mysterious, brooding, and have a lot of vivid metaphorical imagery. The chorus, by contrast, is very straightforward. It's focused more on melody, cadence, singability, and a very clear message than it is painting a vivid portrait. You have lines like, the more you say, the less I know, and wreck my plans, that's my man. These lines reinforce the intriguing mystery about this guy. But it's done so in a much more straightforward, on-the-nose kind of way. The lyrics also make great use of repetition and call back to previous lyrics in a way that's kind of distinctly Taylor Swift. But for example, when you get to the bridge of the song, it very closely mirrors verse 2. In verse 2, she goes, Life was a willow and it bent right to your wind. And in the bridge, Life was a willow and it bent right to your wind. Same cadence and same lyrics, but different enough to feel like a different section, despite the lyrics tying those two parts of the song together. She also creates tension and resolves it using the same technique. This is another thing that she often does very well. But in verse 1 she says, if it was an open shut case, I never would have known from 
from the look on your face. Is it an open shut case? We don't know. That is until the third verse towards the very end of the song where she instead says, now this is an open shut case. Guess I should have known from the look on your face. She does this hindsight is 2020 thing where she's like, oh, in retrospect, I obviously should have seen the it. The repetition and callback thing might even extend to previous songs that she's written. And this could be a bit of a stretch. There's a chance that these are just indicative of Taylor's writing style and common tropes, phrases, words that she likes to use. But the way that she's so calculated, I kind of like to believe that this is intention. For example, when she says the line, wherever you stray, I follow, she expresses a very similar sentiment in the song Love that has the line in the chorus, can I go where you go. She also, in the chorus of Willow, says, you know that my train could take you home. In the very next song on the Evermore album, Champagne Problem, she opens the song with the line, you booked the night train for a reason. That, to me, feels intentional. It helps tie this song to her larger body of work. And I think this is part of why she's been able to establish herself as such a well-entrenched brand as a songwriter. It's because she does seem to have this very clear identity across the span of songs that she writes. Then beyond the lyrics, you have the more musical elements of the song. The melody, the chord progression, the production, all the things that really make the song shine. One thing I thought was fascinating about this is she opens the song talking about a ship rolling in at night. And the song very clearly, from start to finish, feels like all the sections just kind of roll into one another. There's no harsh or distinct breaks or jumps between sections or even within sections. The chord progression's kind of fun, too, particularly in the verse. To start the verse, she's just alternating between the six chord and the five chord in the key. Going back and forth between those two chords makes it feel very like medieval folky almost. The six chord sounds like this. It's very resolved, very sure of itself. The five chord, a little lighter, a little bit more of a question mark. And there's just this really nice push and pull back and forth between those two chords. Six, five, six, five. The push and pull between those two chords are enough for most of the entire verse until at the end of the stanza you go from the six to the five to the four. And even though the four chord doesn't feel completely resolved, it does feel like a nice break from the tension that the six and the five chords are creating. The instrumentation and the production of the song is really fascinating too. The instrumentation's built mostly around guitar and piano layers, but there's a sound that carries all the way through and is kind of a pivotal, almost counter melody to her vocals throughout the whole song. It's kind of sad and soulful, but also playful. The other thing that really helps that is in the background, you can hear these layers of strings, pads, other sounds that just add this lushness to the chord progression. So by itself, everything I've covered is enough to already make this my favorite Taylor Swift song. But what she does with it next makes it, in my opinion, so that there's no contest. Fight me about it in the comments, but it's by far and away her best song because of all of the other versions of this that she released. Taylor Swift has released five total different versions of the song, including the original. And four of those came out within five days of each other, right after the album's release. And these are all so great. There's not a single one of them that I don't like. They all pay homage to the original, but are different enough to kind of be their own unique takes on the song. To start, you've got the Dancing Witch version, which was remixed by a Swedish producer named Elvira. This version keeps the same kind of eerie, mysterious aesthetic, but mixes in a lot more classic like EDM and mainstream pop style elements. Very bright, kind of shimmering version of the song. It's beautiful. Then you have the Lonely Witch version. This one's probably the most similar to the original. It's still centered primarily around acoustic guitar and piano. But that's just about it. It's very stripped down. This is the version you'd expect to hear if she gathered like 20 people in a living room. Then there's the Moonlit Witch version of this song. This one takes on more of an indie pop aesthetic. It uses a lot of synthetic sounds very similar to Elvira's version, but they're more subdued and laid back. And then as if those four versions aren't enough, a handful of months later, Taylor put out the 90s trend remix. And this might be my favorite of all the remixed versions, because this is just a straight up pop EDM song. It's got a lot of trap elements in there, 808 bass, heavy kick, machine gun style hi-hats. The chorus is not so much a chorus as it is a build to take you to the drop. You get a lot of those standard like clap build style production that you hear in a lot of EDM music. And then the drop is really fun. It's super clean, super well produced, and it's reminiscent of artists like Elenium and Griffin. So there you go. Willow. It's a masterpiece. Don't agree? Let's fight about it. Not actually, but you can tell me why down below. And if there's another Taylor Swift song that you think deserves to reign supreme, let me know. Maybe I'll cover that one next. Otherwise, if you've made it this far, please, please, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and like this video. And that's all she wrote. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.